Welcome to the verse-by-verse study of the book of Romans. We shall finish chapter 2 today. Recall last week the author gave us a stern warning to both the Jew and the Gentile that we need to be careful about where we place our faith. Do we believe like many folks today and in Paul's day that we are good enough, righteous enough to avoid God's judgment? And if we do, why do we believe that? Well, Paul points out because we believe we're, we're good, we're an honest person, certainly better than most folks, or, and or we believe we've performed certain works. We go to church, we were baptized, we took communion, we gave money, we read the Bible. Paul's argument is that that's a dangerous belief, that Christianity is not about rituals, nor about comparisons. It is more about, first and foremost, about faith. Faith where? Faith in Christ. A faith that is validated by a changed life, a changed mindset, and the fruit then flows from that faith. Paul said in the first chapter, quoting the Old Testament, the righteous will live, will walk by faith faith. So why is faith so important? Because our belief dictates our behavior. Paul will address this issue beginning in verse 17 by using as an example a prideful Jewish Pharisee. And understand that Paul knows what he's talking about because Paul is describing himself before he came to faith. Let's begin. Now you If you call yourself a Jew or a Christian, if you rely on the law, meaning your performance, your good works, and boast in God, most Jews at this time believed just because they were born a Jew, then they were righteous. First, they felt they were better than everyone else, certainly the better than the Gentiles. And because they were a circumcised Jew, they also knew the law. They were trained in the law, which also made them righteous, self-righteous. But as Paul states, stated previously in verse 13, just because we know the law, know God's word, the scripture, or we go to church or we do other good works, that alone is not enough to make us righteous. Paul continues in verse 18, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in dark, dark, or in the dark, or you're an, or you believe you're an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the little children, because you have, in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Again, Paul is saying, we may know Scripture, we may even teach Scripture, but that alone does not make us more righteous, more better, good enough. In fact, if we're not careful, his point is, we can actually, that can make us more prideful, self-righteous by believing we're somehow superior to others. The passage is warning that our ego can begin to crowd out God because we believe we're the guide, we're the light, we're the teacher rather than God. In fact, the closer we get to God's true light, the more we should see our own sin, which should make us humble. If we truly understand Scripture, it should make us humble because it, sh- it convicts us of how unrighteous, unrighteous we actually are apart from God's grace. Just like Jesus told the, the Pharisee Nicodemus, who was a senior revered teacher of the law, that he needed to, be, to humble himself and be born again, born again, in order to become righteous enough to escape God's judgment and to see, to enter heaven, the kingdom of God. So what does this term born again mean? To be reborn from above and undergo a complete, complete spiritual transformation. It means the old broken person who was in bondage to sin, who was burdened by the weight of guilt, selfishness, regrets, and hurts. They were lacking peace. That old person dies and a new, changed person who is fully forgiven, fully loved, fully accepted by God, a child of God, in Christ, is born. 
in Christ means we now share God's, Christ's DNA. Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. We now view sin, people, life totally differently. Our life now has new purpose, joy, and peace. So how do we become born again? By sincerely asking God via the salvation, for salvation in prayer. The prayer, here's an example. We, we first admit that we're a sinner, and we humbly ask for his forgiveness, not because we're good enough, but because Christ was good enough. We have faith he was good enough, and he paid for our sins, the sins of the past, present, and future, and he saved us from the penalty and the stain of our sin. As a result, we pledge that Christ, we ask him to come into our life, into our new life, to be our strength, our wisdom, our guide, to be our Lord, and to begin to live and walk in life, in faith, in Christ. Again, this in Christ is the key, is important, because now we have divine access, 7 by 24, to his strength, his guidance, and a desire and a capacity to walk away from sin that we could not do before. There becomes a marked difference in our life, a new freedom, joy, peace, security, and discernment about what is right and what is wrong. It gives us direction. Do we always follow that? No, but when we don't, we're convicted, and, it, and we turn from that sin. Now, Paul will, Paul will give us the, uh, what happens when we become a Pharisee, when anyone claims that they are walking in faith, but there's no changed life. There is no fruit. He says in verse 21, You then who teach others, do you teach yourself? Do you preach? Do you practice what you preach? You who preach against stealing, you have never stolen. Do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Remember, Christ said even if we lust with our eyes, that's committing adultery. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Meaning, do you go after idols above God, the love of money, power, position? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? Jesus calls this behavior to be a hypocrite, meaning we tell the world with words that we are a Christian or a Jew, yet we walk, our walk speaks otherwise. So what happens when we do that? Paul tells us in verse 24, and he's actually quoting Isaiah 52, 5. As it is written, God's name will be, is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of of you because of your behavior. Paul is pointing out that this behavior dishonors God. This behavior sends a wrong, confusing, corrupted message about who Christ is to the non-believer. Now Paul turns to the uh, prideful mark of the Jew. This mark they relied upon as a physical sign that they were confirmed to be righteous and set apart from other non-believers. Paul says, circumcision has value if, if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had never been circumcised. So then if those who are not circumcised keep the laws, keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will, con will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, you have the law and you've been circumcised, you are still a lawbreaker or, or a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew or a Christian who is one who only is a Jew outwardly, a Christian only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. Again, Paul's point is the, this act, this physical act of circumcision, this alone will not make us good enough. Just like baptism or communion will not make us good enough. Only faith in Christ makes us good enough to where we become declared righteous. We become justified before God. We are justified by faith, not by works. 
Again, justified means we will be judged righteous by God because of what Christ did, not because what we did. Now, Paul will close the chapter with saying that you are not made a Jew or a Christian by this external ritual or any external ritual. It needs to be an internal change, a change of heart. Starting with verse 20, not ending in verse 29. No, no, a person is a Jew or a Christian. In other words, you're, you're not a Jew or a Christian by outward appearance. A person is a Jew or a Christian who has been changed is one inwardly. There's a change inwardly. What kind of change, Paul? And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, internal heart transplant by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Paul is confirming the Old Testament when we truly became, become a person of faith, God promised to give us a new heart, this heart transplant, a new heart like his, and the powerful gift of the indwelling of the God's Holy Spirit. Well, that concludes chapter 2. We shall begin chapter 3 next week. Until then, may God bless you, bless you and your family with both his grace and his peace. Aloha.